good afternoon to you ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Soland and White Line Cruises welcome aboard the White Scene for our afternoon cruise on a voyage of discovery to the naval dockyard of Portsmouth we should be cruising across the Soland the Soland is the water that divides the Isle of Wight from the mainland and where we are at the present time it's about five and a half miles across one of the busiest uh, seaways in the world with the vessels from Portsmouth Naval Dockyard and Southampton Docks all using the same stretch of water and numbers of ships can be uh, over 500 every day counting the Isle of Wight ferries and of course all the large uh, liners like the QE2 and the Canberra make their way across the same stretch of water to the docks of Southampton we're heading towards the naval base of Portsmouth. Portsmouth is the number one naval dockyard in the United Kingdom. If you care to look on our left hand side you can see we're just being overtaken by a hovercraft. Hover travel run a service between Ride and South Sea. Operate by several hovercraft and on a day like today they would make the journey in about 10 minutes. The average speed of the hovercraft is about 35 knots. And over on the left hand side we have a ship on its way out through the Solent and there we have uh, a fishing boat so quite a variety of ships to see today and coming up on the right hand side we have Spitbank Fort Spitbank Fort built in the 1860s one of several forts built by Lord Palmerston who was seriously concerned about the possible intentions of the French built in the entrance to the naval dockyard of Portsmouth it's about a half a mile off of the uh, South Sea coastline with its own freshwater well 420 feet deep. As we make our way around towards the Bar Channel you can see a warship just coming alongside us. This is HMS Manchester, a Sheffield class destroyer, batch 3 Sheffield class destroyer at about 3,800 tonnes with a Sea Dart missile system 4.5 inch gun on the forward end of the ship. She's just making her way out towards the channel Coming up on our right hand side we have the Royal Garrison Church, a church with no roof. Originally built as a traveller's hospice, it was extensively bombed during the last war and it lost its roof to one of the worst air raids by the German bombers and has been left as a permanent memorial to the many hundreds of people killed in and around the naval base of Portsmouth. We're just passing the Round Tower on the right, originally built by Henry VIII in the early 15th century once again to guard Portsmouth against uh, French attack and there's two of these towers one either side of the harbour staying on the right hand side as we make our way through the entrance we have uh, the gum wharf terminal of Whitelink in the Canberra dock and Whitelink operate four car ferries to the Isle of Wight called St. Class uh, ferries they carry 140 cars or assortment of cars, lorries and coaches and about a thousand passengers. Whitelink also have two fast ferries, fast aluminium catamaran ferries that run between the Portsmouth Harbour Station and Ride Pier. Just coming up on our right hand side we have HMS Warrior, first of the ironclad battleships. Originally laid down in 1859, launched on the 29th day of December 1860. With a tonnage of 9,210 tonnes, 380 feet long. Width, 58 and a half feet. The masts on the Warrior are about 180 feet high. Flying from the after yard arm, you can see a red ensign. Now this is most unusual because most of the Royal Naval ships you'll see today will be flying the white ensign, except the fleet auxiliaries. But in the olden days, the Royal Naval Fleet was divided into three fleets. The Red Fleet, the Blue Fleet and the White Fleet. And Warrior at the time was flagship of the Red Fleet. So it was deemed she should fly the Red Ensign to this day. Just to the left of the Warrior, we have our pontoon in the dockyard where we land people to visit all the historic attractions. And of course, as you probably know, Portsmouth is the Naval Historic Centre of the world. So that's the warrior on the right. The hull thickness is about 16 inches 
solid teak backed by two inches of wrought iron. As we make our way along, we're just coming up towards the semaphore tower. The semaphore tower is where the Queen's Harbour Master Portsmouth controls all shipping movements around this very busy port. All controlled with VHF radio, radar and closed circuit television. Every ship, including ourselves, have to call up and ask the Harbour Master for official permission to enter the naval base of Portsmouth. Staying on the right there, we're just coming up to D96. Once again, this is a Batch 3 Sheffield class destroyer. And this is the sister ship to the Manchester you saw earlier on. With the automatic 4.5 inch gun forward, Sea Dart missiles, you can see the holders just in front of the bridge. Crew, about 230 officers and men. Carry the Lynx Mark II helicopter at the after end of the ship. We're now just coming alongside a Duke class warship. Now the Duke class warships are the very lightest ships in the naval fleet. And making our way along past the warship, you'll see just coming into sight HMS Victory. HMS Victory, probably the most famous naval ship in the world. Lord Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. She was originally laid down in Chatham in Kent in the 1760s, built as a first-rate three-decked 105 gunship of the line. In 1922, it was feared she would sink at her moorings, so she was put into number two dry dock, where you can see her at the present time. Open to the public in 1928. And since that day, a vast amount of money has been spent to maintain her in her full Trafalgar atmosphere. Just after the victory, you'll see a dome-shaped uh, building just coming into view, which houses the Mary Rose. This is the Mary Rose Ship Hall. Henry VIII's favourite warship sank on a warm July afternoon in 1545, just the other side of Spitbank Fort. Laid on the seabed for over 400 years. Just coming up towards another Duke-class warship, HMS Northumberland, the very latest in naval technology. Sea Harpoon missiles just in front of the uh, bridge. There's four facing outboard each side of the ship. And an automatic 4.5 inch gun on the foredeck. About 160 officers and men look after the ship. It's powered by Rolls Royce Spy engines to a top speed approximately 30 knots. We're making our way up towards the uh, North Railway Jetty and round into the tidal basin. Just coming up towards a Sheffield class destroyer. It's HMS Southampton. HMS Southampton is a batch two Sheffield class destroyer. At 3,500 tons, once again armed with Sea Dart missiles. Automatic 4.5 inch gun forward. They also have the Vulcan Phalax cannons, the anti-missile gun, but you can see that's the white cone just alongside the funnel there, like a very modern day Gatling gun, firing 20 millimeter titanium tip cannon shells at a rapid rate of over 3,000 rounds a minute. This puts up a wall of steel to protect the ship against any missiles fired at it. Sea Dart missiles there underneath the cover you can see just in front of the, the wheelhouse. A171, HMS Endurance. This is the only Royal Naval ship that's not grey. As you can see, uh, she's a bright red. She's an ice patrol ship. Spends most of its life in the South Pole regions and around the Falkland Isles. Carries its own helicopter and a detachment of Royal Marine Commandos when on patrol. And she's usually on patrol for six months of the year. L3027 Surgerite. This is a logistics landing ship. As we make our way along, just coming up towards two of our aircraft carriers. The Illustrious is the one in the distance there, just inside the dock. 
and we're just proceeding alongside the Ark Royal. The Ark Royal, at about 19,500 tonnes, armed with three Vulcan Phallix cannons to protect the ship against any missiles fired at it. She has a crew of approximately 670 officers and men and 240 air crew. She would carry 10 Sea Harrier vertical takeoff planes and 9 Sea King helicopters. The ship has a ski ramp type flight deck at the forward end. This is to facilitate the easy takeoff of the Sea Harriers. If they go forward and vertical at the same time, they can take off quicker and they use less fuel, so enabling them to stay airborne for a longer period. The anti-submarine Mark 10 mortar is on the side of the ship and the Sea Dart missiles are just in front of the bridge over on the starboard side. With a top speed approaching 30 knots from its four Rolls-Royce Olympus engines. There's the Vulcan Phylex cannon up on the bow of the ship. Making our way around into Fountain Lake, the F236 there. This is another Duke class warship. This is HMS Montrose. Two diesel electric submarines just inside the Montrose. Another Sheffield class destroyer and the Royal Yacht Britannia. Built in 1953, the envy of the rest of the world. HMS Glasgow, D88, the Sheffield class destroyer very much the workhorse of the Royal Naval Fleet. At about 3,600 tonnes with the Sea Dart missile system, 4.5 inch gun forward, Vulcan Phylex cannons, anti-aircraft guns and the Mark II Lynx helicopter. And the D89 HMS Exeter. L10, this is HMS Fearless an amphibious warfare forces ship. At 19,000 tonnes fully flooded, the ship would sink down into the water and open the large stern door you can see, and the Royal Marine Commandos would drive their assault craft up into the ship. It would then become a mothership. It can carry 700 Royal Marine Commandos. We're now coming around to the Continental Ferry Port and the commercial docks. You can see the Fife's banana boat just inside there one of the commercial berths and one of the large P&O ferries in the Continental Ferry Port. HMS Bristol just coming up on the right. HMS Bristol is the only Type 82 destroyer that was ever built. This is the D-23, originally designed to escort aircraft carriers. It's now permanently moored off of Whale Island where it's used by the Royal Naval Training School of HMS Excellent for training and accommodation purposes. the top of the harbour, on our right hand side, you can see Porchester Castle, built in the year 285 AD by the Romans. It was later rebuilt by the Normans. And between us and the top of the harbour, we have over 16 square miles of mud banks. The submarine you can see there is HMS Otis. HMS Otis has now finished its active service and is shortly to go for scrap and there's several older warships up towards Farrow Creek awaiting disposal. Looking back over on the left hand side, a little bit further off the ships now, as we make our way along the Gosport side of Portsmouth Naval Dockyard. Barrow Island, 
Barrow Island, known to the locals as Rat Island. And it got the name Rat Island because in the uh, olden times, French prisoners of war, which were kept in the prison hulks, which were moored close by to those yachts you can see on our right, as they died off, they were taken ashore to Barrow Island and not very ceremoniously buried, and the island became infested with rats. After that, the island was used as a base for homing pigeons. The homing pigeon was the only means of communication back home to England before the advent of radio telegraphy. So we seen one of our other craft there. It's making its way on a harbour cruise around the dockyard. Making our way along the Gosport side, passing the Cameron Nicholson's Marina very shortly and proceeding back towards the entrance of the naval base. Just passing the uh, Gosport Marina of Camper Nicholson's on our right. You can see the absolutely magnificent yacht Endeavour in their straddle hoist. The Endeavour is an original J class yacht. And quite a vast amount of money has been spent to bring it back to its former glory. Originally built in the early 1930s. Like the uh, Valshida, which you can see there, that's just the hull of the Valshida. Now she'd originally built for Sir Tommy Sopwith, and it was named after his three daughters. Just passing Hasler Creek, Hasler Marina lightship there, marks the port hand side at the entrance to Hasler Creek, and Hasler Creek is the home of the naval submarines in Portsmouth. The gun on the wall off of HMS Andrew, wartime uh, submarine and it was mounted on the wall dedicated to all submariners. HMS Dolphin, this is the shore establishment. All submariners are trained at HMS Dolphin before being allocated their various ships. Back out through the harbour entrance and out into the Solent. Customs vessel just proceeding into the harbour, returning from uh, one of their patrols. And we're just coming up to Spice Island, Traitor's Gate. There, Traitor's Gate, quite an interesting story. They got the name in the olden days. We didn't used to treat prisoners like we do now. Nowadays, we give them turkey and uh, look after them very well and send them on foreign holidays and take them shopping. But in the olden days, we used to export them. And one of the places we used to export them was Australia. It was over 200 years ago that the first settlers were brought through Traitor's Gate, rode out into the Solent, put in the sailing ships, and after the nine-month journey to Australia, in which half of them died on the way of scurvy and all other horrible diseases, they were landed in Australia, and they became the first settlers. Of course, the Australians have got their own back now by sending us home and away neighbours, Sal Block H, Dame Edna, and the cricket team, which we don't even talk about. Making our way along the South Sea coastline, we're just passing the South Sea War Memorial. Originally unveiled by the Duke of York in 1923, dedicated to all those ranks and ratings 
left Portsmouth never to return, and whose only grave is that of the sea. The inscription on the base of the memorial reads as follows, in honour of those ranks and ratings who laid down their lives in defence of the Empire, and have no other grave than that of the sea. An extension to it was unveiled in the form of a sunken walled garden by the Queen Mother in 1953, and that's dedicated to all the servicemen of the Second World War who left Portsmouth never to return. Western approaches to the naval base of Portsmouth. You can see uh, Fort Bunkton there just coming up on the right. As we pass Fort Monkton, we're coming down towards uh, Fort Gilkicker, guarding the western approaches to the naval base of Portsmouth. Used by the Royal Navy to signal to warships lying in the Spithead anchorage, they would signal by means of the Aldis lamp. That's the flashing light that makes no noise, using various codes. And on top of Fort Gilkicker, you can see a radar scanner just uh, moving round and round there monitoring all ships approaching the naval dockyard area. shortly ladies and gentlemen we should be back alongside Wright Pier. Thank you for joining us on our voyage of discovery to the naval base and along the Solent waters this afternoon. Don't forget we do run cruises to almost all the Solent destinations including Spitbank Fort, Buckler's Hard, Howard's Way and to see some of the liners like the QE2. On behalf of myself and all our crews we hope you've enjoyed our video and look forward to the pleasure of your company on one of our other cruises at some time in the future. Thank you very much and wish you a safe and pleasant onward journey.